Today we're going to talk about the miracle power of Christmas. And, and we're going to talk about it in a rather unique way, I hope. Um, we're going to talk about it by the workings of the Holy Spirit. So many times that we can just see in the Christmas story, we see a manger, and which is that's so true. And we see a babe, which is so true. And we see a Mary and a Joseph. But today I want you to find another character that was so vital in the process of the Christmas story. And I tell you, this one has opportunity to move in our lives. So today we're going to talk about the miraculous power of Christmas through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So it's a supernatural. And I just pray today that, that if Christmas is a hard time for you this year, I mean, as we all go through seasons, if this is a hard season for you, then I pray that the Holy Spirit would just hold you dear and will comfort you and will strengthen you, and you will find a source of strength in him, possibly deeper than you ever knew possible. And if this is a, a great time, if you're on top of the mountain today, then I hope that you can remember what it felt like to be on the other end. And you can remain generous and loving and caring, and you make sure to take time of praise and worship in your midst of your Christmas. Amen? So the Lord is just so good to us. Uh, in, in, uh, in the world today, we come across as believers in two ways. One, we're either going to be a consumer, which that means that we're going to always be taken in or very little giving out, or we're going to be a producer. And I pray that in our lives that God has done so much in us that we're just determined that we're going to be that one that gives out. We're going to be that one that gives that word of encouragement, that gives that handshake. We're not going to be that one standing in line that's fighting over the next place in line. But we're going to be that producer, that one that God has produced so much in your life that you've got so much to give. And if that's you today, I want you to leap to your feet, and I want you to give the Lord a praise offering. Would you do it? That God has done so much in your life. Man, God. I want you to know God's been good to me, Dave. The Lord, go ahead and tell somebody, God's been good to me. God has just been good to me. <laughs> you know, so uh, whether, whether we find a trinket on the tree or not, I tell you what, what God's done for me, there's no trinket on the tree that can't compare with what God in his goodness has done for us. Amen. So we determined today that we're going to be that person that gives during this season. And we're looking at the Holy Spirit's role, unique, the Holy Spirit's role in Christmas, all right? There's three major scriptures in the Christmas story that I want to mention. I'm going to mention several more scriptures, but there's three that kind of get us thinking in the right line of it. And the first one is Luke chapter 1, verse 34, and it says, How would this happen since I am a virgin? That's Mary speaking. She said, God, I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? I pray that that's your heart, that the Holy Spirit has been working in your life, that, that when God gives you a promise of what he wants to do and what he wants to uh, produce in your life, that you can be that one says, God, I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? And it's important that we would respond in that way. God, I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? Because there's a cooperation that we have to do. I mean, it's not just God and certainly not just us, is it? Because we can't produce it ourselves. It becomes a cooperation between us and the Lord. We have the believing part and he has the doing part. Amen. I have the part to trust him and he has the part to go forth. So it's just real important that I understand that in this process, God, I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? And that was Mary's response. And that tells us what kind of person that she was. Now, in another verse is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. It says, for nothing will be impossible with God. I want you to know that's the answer in all of our lives. Nothing is impossible with God. You don't understand, Brother Jerry. You don't understand what I'm going through, but I'm here to say nothing is impossible with God. And the same word that the angel was given out then, that same angel is still giving it out today. So whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through, whatever you're having to deal with, I want you to know nothing is impossible with God. 
And the third one that kind of gets us thinking, right, in the area of Christmas story, it says, the angel answered and said to her, Mary said, I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? And then the answer of that was, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. How is God going to change your situation? The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. How is God going to turn that husband around? I, God's going to come upon him is how it's going to happen. How is God going to turn my circumstance around? How is God going to change my health situation? How is God going to change my financial situation? How is God going to turn, turn my relationship around? It's because God, the Holy Spirit, is going to come upon you. That was the complete answer, and that is the answer to the story. How did it happen? How was there miraculous birth? How did God take on the form of a baby? This because the Holy Spirit came upon. So if we're going to have help in your life, we're going to have to learn to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right, now, in the Bible, there's two major books that reveal to us uh, the Christmas story. One is Matthew. Now, Matthew reveals it through the genealogy because he was speaking to the Jewish people at that time. He wanted to prove that Jesus was the person that he said he was. So he goes all the way back and proves that he was the son of David. I mean, he follows the, the genealogy right through. But now Luke tells a different version because Luke was a physician. Man, miracles fascinated Luke. I'm going to tell you what, Luke was my kind of guy. Man, because Luke saw the, the uh, when he looked at the miraculous birth, he saw it through these eyes that so desired to see the miracle power of God. That's why the book of Luke is so full of miracles of God. There's, he was a doctor, and he was amazed when somebody was healed. He was amazed when somebody could walk. He was amazed when blind eyes could heal. So it's just a wonderful way. Now, he also recorded the birth of Jesus, and he did it through those miracle eyes, and he helped us to see the miracle of Christmas. Amen? Now, I, I, I love in the sense that, uh, that Luke, not only did he write the book of Luke, and God used him by the Holy Spirit, the Lord was looking through the eyes and seeing the marvelous miracles that God did. I tell you what, God's trying to get our attention. Do you realize that the, all the Gospels is written as our examples of the way that we're to live? Do you understand that everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus said, the way that he handled every situation, it was all to be an example in your life and in my life. This is the way I want you to live. Not only did God want to present to us the way to live, he wanted to present the way that we can handle difficulty how we're going to handle times of, of extreme strain. He wanted to us to be able to be able to handle circumstances. He even taught us how to handle storms in our life. And he told us how to handle health issues. And, I mean, the Gospels is so wonderful because it gives Jesus going through every circumstance that you could ever face. And the Lord, by example, told us how to do it. I mean, it's like a first grade level. He didn't just tell us, he showed us. He lived it out. And not only that, he told us, he taught us how to pray. He taught us how to seek God. He taught us, he taught us how to receive from the Lord. It is just so full. Now I want you to know today, how can we, with that being our example, how could we possibly believe? believe that God wants us to live some kind of mediocre uh, 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 life when God has every example that we have in the Bible, every example of us knowing how to live, every one of them is built around the supernatural power of God. They're all miraculous. Jesus handled everything through the miracle power of God. He handled everything, every circumstance that he faced. He handled it through the miracle power of God. I tell you, God's got a little note going on for us, and that note says, I want you to be able to begin to handle your life through the miracle power of God. God said, I love you. I want to help you. I want to be involved in your life. I care about you. I care about your hurts. I care about your pains. I care about your difficulties, and I want to be involved in your life. And if you will begin to trust me, you will find 
the miracle power of God also. So it's just wonderful. Praise God how the Lord teaches us. All right, the first thing we're going to know about the Holy Spirit involving around Christmas, that it didn't start with Christmas. The Holy Spirit. Some of us say, well, how does he know? Because the Holy Spirit's been here ever since time, before time. The Holy Spirit has been active in the workings of God. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 2, the Holy Spirit makes his entrance. The second verse in all of the Bible, the Holy Spirit made his entrance. It says, the earth was formless and void or waste and emptiness and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Sound like your life? <laughs> I've been there before and been, I don't know what it is to live like that. And said, but, um, but the Spirit of God was moving. That word moving means he was hovering. He was brooding. I tell you what the Lord's doing in all of our lives, what the Holy Spirit wants to do. God's not satisfied with us living mediocre, being downcast, being trodden under, being defeated, being discouraged. God's not satisfied with that. The Holy Spirit broods over those dark places in all of our lives. And he's brooding over it because he's ready to do something miraculous. And right in the midst of that, God stepped up and God began to speak. And when God began to speak, Genesis, starting with Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, then creation started. The Holy Spirit, can you just see this bright light zipping through the universe, creating everything that God the Father was speaking through his Son? Every thing that was declaring, let there be man, and let there be light, and, and let there be a firmament. And he and the Holy Spirit was quickly moving because the Holy Spirit is that that takes nothing and makes something for the glory of God. Now, he revealed himself there, but not only did he reveal himself in that way, in chapter 2 of Genesis, because, man, the Holy Spirit is the expert at this stuff, all right? You may think you're the expert, but I'm telling you, you need to get out of the driver's seat and need to put Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in that driver's seat. And Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, not only did he create zapping through the universe and, 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 and creating everything that God's word, that God the Father was speaking through Jesus, and, but he was zipping and zapping and uh, creating and molding and shaping and bringing worlds into creation because he's such an expert at it. But then in verse 2, God created man. In the creation, man was created in chapter 2. But, but man was lifeless. I, I mean, I, I don't know what type of form that was, but man was lifeless. I, I often think that was kind of like man was when I began to watch prehistoric man. There is, it's a sense of, of animalistic, but God said, I'm not satisfied with you being that. And so in chapter 2 of verse 7, it's so wonderful because into a form of life, the Bible says, that God breathed. Now, that word breathe is an unusual word because that word breathe is the word spirit. What happened was when God into Adam, the Holy Spirit went into Adam and man became a life-giving spirit for the glory of God. And you and I, man, the Holy Spirit not only knows how to create what you need out here. The Holy Spirit also knows what to create what we need inside here. And in fact, he's such a master inside here. That's where he usually starts in all of our lives. He starts right on the inside, and he's the kind that works inside out. Amen? He begins to deal with our hearts and deal with our souls. He begins to convict us and tell us ways to walk and tell us things to do. And if we will simply obey that, it won't belong to that that is in here as out here. And we we find of our lives are completely turned around for the glory of God. So it's just wonderful. Now, in the book of 2 Peter, it's where we talk about the Holy Spirit beginning. It's, it's our, our seeing the origins of the things that the Holy Spirit did. The Bible said, for no prophecy. Now, now the wonderful thing about 2 Peter chapter 1 is, is talking about every verse in the Bible. Every verse. And, and what, do you, what has God ever said to you? Uh, well, we have a Genesis to uh, Revelations, right? There's a lot of words that God has spoken to us. There's a lot of words that God has said to us. But notice what it says in the second Peter. It said, for no prophecy, every prophecy 
that has been, was, produced, was not produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were, this one says, carried along. Most versions say moved as they was moved by the Holy Spirit. So every word that you've ever heard from God came through the Holy Spirit's voice. Every word, every word that, God, that you have from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, every anointed word that you ever heard preached, every beautiful song that's been anointed of the Holy Spirit that God was in, that came by way of the Holy Spirit. Every kind gesture, every point of love, anything in us good at all came by way of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to remind you again that God the Father is sitting on the throne. He's still dreaming and he's still believing for all of us. And the Son is right there seated on the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit is the one that is here to cause those dreams to live. He is the creative force of God. If you need something in your life, it's the Holy Spirit that has the power and the ability to go out and to create it for the glory of the Lord. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, not only does, was he the originator of every scripture, every promise, man. You know there's 7,000 in that Bible? There's really over 7,000 scriptures of promise. You could not have a need in your life that the Holy Spirit has not already spoken God's will over that particular situation because every promise is, was breathed. The Bible said it was God breathed. The Holy Spirit breathed it out of those that wrote, the, wrote down the words that the Holy Spirit was saying. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, notice what it said. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own. By, how did he do that? By placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts. God has identified us that we belong to him by placing the Holy Spirit. If somebody just needs to stand up and give the Holy Spirit a round of applause and praise. Because God has identified you. He's identified us. He says, you belong to me. You don't belong to the devil. You belong to me. And God did that by putting, by putting the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Amen. So he has identified, the scripture says, he has identified us as his own by placing, notice what it says now, by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment, man, the first point, the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised to us. Every time you can sense the presence of the Lord in your heart, every time that you can sense the Holy Spirit speaking a word of encouragement to you, every time that you have been down and you felt God trying to raise you up, that was the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit is doing that, that tells you that he's the guarantee that every promise that God has ever given to you will come to pass. Isn't that wonderful? So he becomes the guarantee force of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, in Romans chapter 8, it says, the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses. So if you want to grow into God, do you want to grow in the things of the Lord? We must learn to identify the Holy Spirit working in our life. In fact, if I'm going to be mature, somebody says, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to show you how mature. I'm going to, I'm going to dress up in this three-piece suit. I'm going to, no, that's not, that's good if you can do that. But that's not how you prove that you're mature in the Lord. The way that you're mature in the Lord, is that you, Holy Spirit? Is that you, Lord, Holy Spirit? Are you guiding me? Are you leading me? Is that person that gives himself to following the impulses of the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit, and, and we're all in, in training mode. It's the wonderful thing about it. That's the wonderful thing about Jesus. This, he gave us an opportunity to be in training mode. And I can learn. Everybody say, I can learn. I can learn the workings of the Holy Spirit. I can grow in the workings of the Holy Spirit. If, if I'm not grown up yet, 
I can grow. You know, the most wonderful thing in a, in a person's life is when you have raised a little one and they're about a year and a half old and they're trying to crawl and they're trying to get up and walk. And I tell you what, parents sit around them and laugh and you say, y'all come look at this little guy. And you laugh and you enjoy that so much because, honey, God gets great a great blessing, great joy out of watching us be trained underneath the Holy Spirit. And though you may get up and fumble some, you may get up and fall some, it's okay <laughs> because God is a place that we can learn and we can grow in the things of God. Amen. Now, uh, though the Holy Spirit is so wonderful in the process. Now, time's real short, so I'm just going to, in just the very next few minutes, I'm going to give you as many things as I can about the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Things that I've seen and, and things through the 50 years of, of living for the Lord that I've been able to watch in God moving in other people's lives. Now, the way I'm going to do this is through the story of Jesus' birth. And I just want to, I want to point out to you very quickly some things that will help you, that will help you grow, that will, that will help you to yield your life more to the wonderfulness of the Holy Spirit. Now, the, in the book of Luke, that miraculous book, everybody say that miraculous book. Don't you love it? Because, see, the same author that authored, the Holy Spirit used to author Luke, also authored Acts. Now, Luke is telling me how to do it, and then Acts is showing me this is what happens when you do it. So it's so wonderful, those two books joined together. It's just so wonderful. And to recognize it was the same Holy Spirit that was inspiring Dr. Luke as he wrote the, the wonderful ways that we would follow the Lord's example. And then in the book of Acts, he shows us how we can follow the Lord's example. Praise God. So the birth of Jesus, according to Dr. Luke, which is so good, in the book of St. Luke, it didn't start with a stable, and it didn't start with a manger. In fact, the wonderfulness of the Holy Spirit started years before that. In fact, in the book of Luke, chapter 1, if we begin right away, beginning, God begins to tell us the story of this Christmas season. And it started with Zechariah and Elizabeth. It says in verse 6, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commands and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. I don't relate to that. All right. Then the angel, but the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. He will be a man with the Spirit and power of Elijah. So the first thing I know is, is that the faith to believe that the Holy Spirit makes miraculous provision that's preceding the need. That's why it started. It didn't start with Jesus in a stable. It started with years before that as God was dealing with the man Zachariah and Elizabeth. And God was making preparation for Jesus to be able to make his entrance into earth. I want you to know, God sent me here to tell you something today. Do you think this need has caught God off guard? I'm here to tell you it did not catch God off guard. There is faith to believe that God has already preceded you into whatever that God is leading you to do or whatever it is that God has already preceded you and provision has already been made. It's not starting with your life, not starting with your problem, baby. Your life is starting with God has already preceded you into that problem and God has already handled that for his glory. And as you get there, you're going to find God preceded me here. So, man, that's just a lot of faith. I find that in the Holy Spirit all the time. I have to keep reminding myself of that. Whenever you face a need, whenever you face a service. Now, here at the church, we get into that a lot. It seems like something will 
take place and it'll immediately say, whoa. Uh, you, and next thought is, that feels like the church is crashing down. But we have to realize, God's already been here. God's already done that. I can remember back when we first built this building, I remember I was so shocked on one weekend. We had spent everything. We were trying to build the building, we were trying to use all the money that we had so we would get a dollar and we'd buy a dollar worth of stuff. We'd get $5 and we'd buy from them. But that particular Friday was different because the bank called. And the bank said, Jerry, come up here. So I went up there, and they said, we're calling in your note. I said, you can't do that. They said, we can do what we want to. And so they said, we're calling in your note. You've got to have $60,000 by Monday, or we're fixing to move in on this thing. Well, $60,000 was like a billion dollars to me. Man, I didn't have $10, much less $60,000. And we went, man, it seemed like it was the most precious time. But in the midst of that, God, by his Holy Spirit, spoke to us and said, I've already been there. I've already got it covered. I've already taken care of it for you. And because we as a church determined not to worry about that, but man, we did some praising for that. How do you handle worry? You handle it with praise and worship. So during that weekend, man, we did some praising. Man, we thank God that $60,000 was there and that we was going to be able to keep our building and that God had worked all of that out. Do you know what happened on Monday? We was able to go to that bank and lay $60,000 down on that desk because God had already been ahead of us. So you've got to keep that. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. This seems like in a moment's time, this thing like, man, this thing's going to crash in on me. It looks like my marriage is ending. It looks like my health is gone. It looks like, man, there's no way I can get through this. What you've got to remember is God's already been there ahead of time, and God has already a Zachariah, and he has already Elizabeth that's in preparing to prepare the way for you. God is there. Amen. So we, we relate to that. And so by the Spirit of the Lord, we just begin to determine, I'm not going to worry. The next time that one of those moments come up, I'm just going to know God's already been there. He's already prepared it. Just the same way it doesn't start with a manger. It started years before in preparation, before Jesus was even thought of on the earth. Now, he was thought of in heaven. Before he was even thought on the earth, God had already been there. And God had already taken care of it. And God had already worked the plan out. And I'm tell you, there's not an issue in our life that's not just like that either. There's not anything. Any sickness, Tony, man, my heart has just been so rejoicing with you, man. I love your heart, man. Tony's facing really what the world would consider. The world would consider it the death sentence are the end. But Tony, your faith in the Lord has said this is not the end of anything. This is the beginning of God revealing his goodness into my life. So when Jesus was born, the miracle was already preset because years before, God had provided John the Baptist the Bible said that will prepare the way of the Lord. <laughs> God's already prepared your way. A little song I used to sing. Why well, would I worry and fret? God's never failed me yet. <laughs> and we learn that we can laugh at the devil and laugh at his lies and laugh at his schemes, don't we? Because God is a God of hidden preparation. God's already got a treasure field that's been prepared for your need. Whatever it is that you're facing, God is already. Now, what the enemy wants to do, the enemy wants you to get your eyes off to God. No, man, we've been through that road, haven't we? We've learned it now can't get my eyes off of God because this is a cooperation. It's God in me. It's God doing the do part. It was God that weekend giving the $60,000, but I had a part and you had a part in that. Our part was to, number one, believe in our heart.
And number two was to line up with our mouth, line our mouth up with our heart. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I, we had an obligation. And whatever you're going through in your life, you've got a part to play, honey. Now, I tell you what, the, the devil is the, is the uh, I started to say he's a good dealer. He's a bad dealer. And he's always dealing with people to give up their promise, to give up their miracle. And the way he does that is this. He brings it and convinces you in your heart. He convinces you in your heart that God's not going to come through for you. And if he can convince you in your heart, you're going to receive the abundance of your heart. And you can tell what's in your heart by what comes out your mouth. So I have this responsibility, I have this cooperation that's working. Number one, I've got to believe my heart. But number two, I've got to line my mouth up. And then there is a third part of that cooperation. i got to overpower that emotions of fear. I've got to begin to release courage. That's what Mary did. Boy, she was so courageous. The Lord, she said, I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? And in the midst of that, the Lord said, my Holy Spirit will come up. There's some of you that's just waiting for that, man. What does the Holy Spirit look like? You know, I have a real hard problem creating a power or making any kind of PowerPoint for the Holy Spirit. Because some people demonstrate it in fire and some people demonstrate it as a dove. I, I was thinking about it. The way, only way I know to demonstrate it is a big smile. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is going ahead of us. And the Holy Spirit has worked it out for us. And the Holy Spirit, if I can just cooperate, if I can just cooperate, if I'm believing my heart, if I can line my mouth up with my heart, and if I can overpower my negative emotions with trust in the Lord, with trust in the Lord, <laughs> then you know what? I can give birth to the Jesus in my life. <laughs> I can give birth to whatever God's wanting to do in my life. Because I have a part <laughs> of cooperating with the Lord. Some of you, some here have almost given up on your dream that God had burned in your heart probably some of you even years before because it seemed like as you've grown older you've just got further and further from that dream but God says don't worry friend your God's never failed you yet honey <laughs> he's never failed you yet and he never will I want you right this morning as we close the service if you've had a dream and the devil has tried to steal that dream. Maybe it's a dream of a happy marriage. Maybe it's a dream of your happiness. Some battles you can't even describe them. I mean, you, it's hard to even, you can't describe anybody. It's what you feel on the inside. And everybody else will be laughing and having a good time, but inside you always feel like you're crying. And then, then some battles are with our health. Man, that can be major situations and, and then some battles is with just you getting older and, and I have that situation and then some of your battles are working relationships, working jobs so many very things but God gave you a dream and that dream is in you as a form of promise I want to say you something if you're today and you say Lord I'm not going to let that dream die. I'm not going to let it die. I have a part, Lord, that I'm going to believe you that you're able, that you've already went ahead. And just like you did for Jesus, you prepared Zachariah and Elizabeth. You have made preparation for me. If that's you, I want you to stand right where you're sitting at. Would you? Would you very quickly? Say, I'm not going to let that dream die. I'm not going to let that dream die. I'm not going to let that dream die. 
you know, it, it can be simply a dream of being able to live for the Lord. Man, I can remember when that was the biggest dream in my life because I had not lived for the Lord for so long. So for, for me to come to a place where I could believe it, that was seen so far away. But I found that when I got there, God had already preceded me and God had already prepared for me. Amen. I want you in Jesus' name. I want us to give that dream. I want us to give that heart to the Lord this afternoon. That's not a worry that God wants us to carry. That's something God wants us to trust Him. Mary, how will this be? Mary, she said, I know you're going to do it, but how are you going to do it? (laughs) Then the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come. The Holy Spirit will come. How is it going to turn around? Because the Holy Spirit's going to come. And remember, he's the zapping creator. (laughs) See, he can zap to this universe. And he can create everything that God has promised. He doesn't need anything to start with. All he needs is somebody to believe the promise. Well, Lord, we stand here before you this morning, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I I first want to thank you for the dream that you've implanted into our lives, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you saw more in me than I could see myself. And Lord, you gave me a dream and you gave me a vision of what you wanted to do in my life, Lord. And Lord, today I may feel like I'm a hundred miles away from it. But how are you going to do it? I believe it. How are you going to do it? You're going you're gonna to do it by the Holy Spirit. By that same Holy Spirit coming up on me. Creative force of the Lord. The Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Won't you give the pressure of that to the Lord now? Would you do that? Would you give the pressure of that to the Lord? Give the pressure of that dream. Just give it to the Lord. Just give that to the Lord. The pressure. The pressure that surrounds that thing to make it happen. To make it work. To make it work out. To make, put the right pieces in the place. I just want you to give that to the Lord. Now I want you. Now Jesus said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I want you to just receive into yourself the the lightness of the Lord. That, Lord, I'm just going to receive your lightness. You've made it light for me. You've taken the heavy load, and you've given me the light load. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, I receive by faith the finishing result of what you've promised whether it's a healed body, whether it's being able to get through this storm, whether it's being able to silence the storm, Lord, I receive by faith your work in Jesus' name. Wow, isn't Jesus something? Man, isn't the Lord something? Man, I tell you, God is something else, man. You now remember, he stepped out on nothing and opened his mouth. And when he stepped out on nothing and opened his mouth, the Holy Spirit began to grow and move and to create. So right now, if you have allowed the Lord's promise to be renewed in your heart, you can know that the Holy Spirit is working in you. Let's give the Lord a great praise offering.